picking up where we left off in verse 10. So if I come, I will bring up what he is doing, talking about, uh, not Demetrius, but talking about Diotrephes. As we talked about Diotrephes two weeks ago, there's not a whole lot we know about him, except for what John gives us here. He was a self-important person who resisted John and resisted the church. Much like uh, Serinthius, who we saw earlier in 1 John, and his false teaching and drawing people out of the church, now we have this uh, diatrophies. And John here is saying that I will bring up what he is doing. If we see what he is doing, we saw that in verse 9. I've written something, something to the church, but Diotrephes, who likes to put himself first, does not acknowledge our authority. You would think that John in and of himself has enough authority, right? The one in whom Jesus loved, was there at the Mount of Transfiguration, took care of Mary and the family after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And yet here's this Diotrephes, at least from all rec records, was probably born 20 years after the resurrection. Don't do that. It flickers every once in a while. Drives me nuts. But this Diotrephes, he's a, he's a young guy, basically, compared to John. And here he is resisting John and the church. John's telling the church, if I come... I'm going to bring up what he's doing. We, we have to hit the nail on the head. We have to deal with the issues. We've got to deal with this individual that's causing issues. And what specifically he's doing, not only is he resisting John in verse 10, John says he's talking wicked nonsense. Wicked nonsense. It reminds me of what Paul said to, to avoid... And talking about endless genealogies and just the, the babbling of fools. I was thinking about that the last couple of weeks. And I'm sure if you were to go on, there's a very well-known site that some pastors, not myself, go to to get basically copy and paste sermons. It's called SermonCentral.com. But the one thing you can look on there is basically what every the people that contribute to it are going to be preaching this weekend. Unfortunately, I would say less than 30% of what's being posted on sermoncentral.com has anything to do with the Bible. Oh, yes, there may be Bible verses that they use, but it's to, to prove their point or their agenda or to say nice and fluffy things. Very few sermons on that site are verse by verse through the Bible. That it's a lot of it sometimes is just babbling. You read some of the things that are posted on there, and it's just somebody who takes the, the newspaper and is just straight talks about the, the events of the week as their sermon and not the Bible. This is very much kind of what we see Diotrephes doing here. That it's just talking wicked nonsense. It's just junk about John and about the church. And not content with that. That's not just all he does. He refuses to welcome the brothers. If we, you remember earlier on in the passage, you talked about the charity of the church towards missionaries that come in. We just had the berries with us a few weeks ago. And how we're receptive and have been supporting of them for many years. Diotrephes was against that. He says, no, 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 don't, don't have them come in. He, he was refusing to accept them and or support them. And specifically, it says that he also stops those who want to and puts them out of the church. What does that mean? Diotrephes, let's say I was Diotrephes in the church and I'm going to pick on the berries because they were just here. Let's say I was Diotrephes, I don't want the berries to come. And I'm going to prevent them from coming. And if you say that you want the berries to come, then me as Diotrephes, I'm going to tell you to leave the church. That's what Diotrephes was doing. 
He was preventing the missionaries coming to, to recharge and recoup and replenish at the church and to go to continue on their mission. And if anybody tried to stop him, John says he, kick, he puts them out of the church. In other words, he kicks them out of the church. Can you imagine that? As John is right in saying that it's wicked nonsense. That the whole point of the church is to support those like the berries who are doing local missions. Or when we had other missionaries come. Or um, in July, end of July, we are going to have the Kellers come. As they're ramping up, they, they finally get the green light to go to the Middle East. And how excited that they're going to be. Imagine me saying, oh no, the Kellers can't come and tell you that they're going to be going to Jordan. And how, how excited they are and the, their preparations that they're making to go. And then if you disagree with me, you know, me kicking you out of the church. But that's exactly what Diotrephes is doing here. It's amazing to think that even in the first century, and specifically, this is John we're talking about here. He's resisting John. The only apostle that's left, John the Beloved, and you're doing this right under his nose? Interesting. In the notes in your outlines for verse uh, 10, he says, if I come, if I come. Uh, actually, it was last, last week's notes. This is a quick review. If I come, the girls have been watching reruns of Wait Till Your Father Gets Home. Wait till your father gets, wait till your father gets, wait till your father gets home. Sorry, those, some of those intro songs are catchy. But that's basically what John's saying here. Wait till I get home. Once I'm in the church, I'm going to deal with theotrophies. He has to deal with theotrophies and the division that he's causing in the church. Verse 11. Beloved. We'll stop there. Beloved. That's the first fill in the blank on your page this morning. Beloved, John, once again, is pastorally concerned. He sees what Diotrephes is doing in the church. And now his concern for them comes out. Beloved, do not imitate evil, but imitate good. What is the evil? What Diotrephes is doing in the church. But imitate good. Whoever does good is from God. And whoever does evil has not seen God. I hate to, well, in many ways, it's the truth. This is a backhanded rebuke of Diotrephes. Because from verses 8 through 10, we've been talking about the charity of the church and issues with Diotrephes. But then... John kind of takes a pause and talks about the love of God versus not having, uh, not seeing God. Doing good versus doing evil. Why is that in here? He's dealing with Diotrephes. He's saying Diotrephes is evil and in fact he's not even a Christian. He is not seeing God. Whoever does evil, he already said that he does wicked things, has not seen God. This reminds me of the conversation Pastor Chris and I, uh, Pastor Chris from Wall came in. He was doing physical therapy down at the hospital and he popped in for a cup of coffee and our conversation was, what are the scariest words in the Bible? What are the scariest words in the Bible? And we can, both came to the conclusion is, depart from me, I never knew you. Unfortunately for Diotrephes, those are the words, unless he repents, He's going to hear. John makes that clear here. Whoever does evil has not seen God. Oh, they can be religious. Diotrephes is obviously religious. But it doesn't seem like he's saved. It doesn't seem like he has a relationship with God. He's resisting John and the people of God and causing problems in the church. Unfortunately, in America... We don't want to realize that across America in pews like these, there's probably a lot of people that are going to hear those scariest words. 
They've been religious their whole life, but no relationship. They've, they've wanted to remain comfortable and just play the, I call it the game, the Christian game. I saw it as a kid going to a large church. And those that played church just to get connections, just to, uh, to network, they call it. But there was no faith. There was no believing in the Bible as God's word to us. There was no prayer life. There was no spiritual growth. And yet, unfortunately, our culture has accepted it, has not challenged it. And unfortunately, we then don't want to take a couple of steps back, as John's saying here, beloved, hello, realize that some of these people are going to be cast into outer darkness, where there's wailing and weeping and gnashing of teeth. I was talking with uh, Clark yesterday on our way back from the tournament. And I mentioned how the other day I've, I've been wearing a CPAP machine now for a number of months, but I accidentally ground my teeth one, one day, like my jaw shifted and I heard it, and it, two of the teeth were grinding against each other just for a moment. And it made me cringe, just the, the, the vibration and the sound of it in my own head. And it made me start to think of when Jesus is talking about hell, and the, the wailing and the gnashing of teeth, that sound, that grinding of teeth, it, there's something jarring and revolting about it. That the realization that whoever does evil has not seen God and thus God is going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. Go into outer darkness where there's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. That's some, that's some heavy words. And yet that's what John is saying here. As we filled in the blank for verse 11, Beloved, beloved, don't follow evil. He that does evil has not seen God. Keep in the back of your minds for a moment as we begin to wrap up the chapter. This idea of seeing God. Well, who in the Bible is seeing God? Well, Moses saw God's backside, turned him white. People said he looked like a ghost. But Jesus said, no man has seen God at any time, but I have made him known to you. I am the embodiment of God to you, so that now you have seen and know and hear God and not died. But he that follows evil has not seen God, and thus, as Jesus said, hasn't seen him, doesn't know him, doesn't, hasn't heard his words. Verse 12 on the other hand, we've been talking about Diotrephes the last couple of weeks and about all the bad things he's been doing. Now John shifts gears and says, but on the other hand, we have Demetrius. Diotrephes bad, Demetrius good. Demetrius received a good testimony from everyone. Everybody likes him. Everybody approves him, of him. No one has a bad word to say. If you guys remember in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and Titus chapter 1, both elders and deacons have to have a good report, both from inside of the church and from outside of the church. Demetrius is, has both. He's being presented by John as he's got a good report and from the truth itself. Now, this may not make sense in the English. This is one of those things in which, I, in, which, in which I wish that the word order switch. And the truth itself is Demetrius' recommendation. He is in the truth itself. He is in this Bible. The truth is in him, and he teaches the truth. That is his first recommendation according to John, and then Demetrius has a great testimony within the church and without the church. That is the, what I think is the right word order for this verse, is that the truth should be primary, that he is in the word and teaching the truth, and then his testimony comes with him. 
We also add our testimony. So John's saying, I add my stamp of approval on Demetrius. Imagine being in the first century, being presented as a leader for a church, whether it's an elder or a deacon, and you've got a letter of recommendation from John. That's like, you can't get any better than that, right? He's the only apostle that's left. John, an apostle, stamped, I recommend Demetrius. Here you go. I mean, you can't get much better than that. But not just John's testimony. John says, our. The, the church is in Asia Minor. And probably, especially the church in Ephesus, is recommending Demetrius. And you know that our testimony is sure. It, in thinking about this, remember, John's in his 90s. He's the only apostle that's left. Paul's dead. Timothy's getting older, if not have already passed away. There's probably now two to three generations of Christians that have grown in the churches. That, For instance, the church in Ephesus, where we know John administered for a time, was started by Paul. And continued by Paul. And Paul had sent different pastors to help them grow. And appointed different people. And now the one who started it's gone. Paul's gone. And here John's continuing it. And I'm sure. I wonder if John ever got tired of people coming up. Especially the kids. Oh John, John. Tell, tell me about the Mount of Transfiguration. Oh John, John. Tell me about the, the Last Supper. Oh, oh John, John. Tell me about the, the garden. I wonder if he ever went, well, I, I wrote a book about that. It's called the Gospel of John. Read it, please. <laughs> or I could also see John, knowing his love for the people, him doing what I would call story time with Uncle John. Where, like Mr. Lee has done for many, many years, and gathering the kids up front. Okay, kids, come on in. I got a story for you. I could totally see John doing that. Story time with Uncle John. And his continuing of not only his testimony, but the message itself. This isn't just John's story, it's the story. Verse 13, I have much to write to you. Kind of reminds me of Paul. Paul does this a number of times. I have a lot to say to you. I'm not going to all write it down, but when I get there, you're going to hear all of it. And here John picks up that same thing. I have much to write to you, but I would rather not write with pen and ink. Next fill in the blank this morning, I have much to say. Well, who has met a preacher that doesn't have much to say? Who, who has met a pastor that doesn't can't talk your ear off? And yet here John definitely has much to say. I can imagine his assessment of what's going on in the church between the Diotrephes and now he's presenting Demetrius as a probably a replacement. Let us get Diotrephes out. Let's get this cancer out. And I've in the wings I've got Demetrius. He's approved by us. Stamp. Let, let's get this transition going. I've got much to say, but it says, oh, I kind of need to be there to do that. In verse 14, I hope to see you soon and that we will talk face to face. Remember earlier, I said to keep that word seen in the back of your head. In fact, let's revisit that real quick. Verse 11, he that does evil has not seen God with his eyes, has not known God. In the same way, John is saying here, I hope to see you, to know you, to have that communication with you, and not just in, by letter or distance, but he says, and we will talk face to face. I mentioned Moses earlier and seeing God. Later records after, uh, as the prophets and apostles record that meeting between Moses and God. It says that Moses saw God face to face. That it's literally face to face. 
And as the disciples were able to see Jesus, the representation of God, Emmanuel, God with us face to face. John says, I hope not only just to see you, but so that we are face to face. So that we are as close as we can be. So that there is true communion. So that there is true relationship. Not that just he's a pen pal. But to be face to face as John was face to face with Jesus. And as Moses was face to face with God. This is a very... I was thinking of it this morning. And I could be wrong. Chris, I could always be wrong. But I think this is only the second time... The phrase face to face shows up in the New Testament. I could be wrong, but I think this is the only, only the second time it comes up in the New Testament. And I'm pretty sure it was Paul that wrote the other time. I will look that up this week and get back to you on it next week. But this is very personal. This is very select. This is very unique in the language of the New Testament. And he ends by saying, I will see you soon last fill in the blanks this morning we will meet face to face we will meet face to face and he leaves them with this peace be to you the friends greet you greet the friends each by name and don't don't leave anybody out tell everybody that i said hi by name enid john says hi by name. That Lee, John greets you by name. That he wants the people to know that relationship, that he's thinking about individuals and not just the church. This goes back to that very beginning, uh, fill in the blank, verse 11, the beloved. That John's concern for them included them by name. Who knows, maybe the, the piece of papyrus or vellum that John was using was small. And he couldn't sit there and say, make sure you say hi to, and then to start to make a list of who everybody he wants to say hi to. Instead he says, greet the friends each by name. It goes back to consistently, all throughout, first John, second John, and third John. His concern for the church, his pastoral care. My little children, my beloved is wanting to guard them. And yet, even in that care, right, he had hard things to say to them. He had hard things to say about Corinthians. He had hard things to say about Diotrephes. Yet, sometimes hard things need to be said. You know, love isn't always smooth talk. Sometimes love includes harsh realities. In which we have clearly seen in 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. John is both giving them the blessings, but also saying, we've got work to do. We've got to deal with Serinthius and his false teaching, and Diotrephes and his um, rejection of the truth. And now we need to put forward Demetrius. We need to get him in a position to help you guys get where you need to go. It's been a, a fun journey going through 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. As I was telling Lee before church started, um, and I, in fact, I'm finishing up my, the, my master's thesis on 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John this week. Actually, it has to be in by Thursday. So it's been a very fun journey in seeing the uniqueness of John, his heart, his purpose in writing, especially in his old age, what his priorities were versus his priorities in writing the gospel. With that, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this beautiful morning. We thank you for those that are here. Now, Lord, as we go to the highways and the byways of life, may we take you with us. May we earnestly seek to see you face to face like Moses. May we seek to see you face to face as the disciples saw Jesus and as John saw Jesus. May we seek to be face to face as John wanted to be face to face with the church. Lord, now we pray that you bless us, that you keep us.
you make your face shine upon us and give us rest this week. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. See you guys next door. Got cookies and coffee.